So let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, I just come to you today. Loving you with all my heart. And understanding a little bit about what you did for me on the cross. Father, I just ask you today to, to pour your anointing out on, on me as, as a speaker and on pour open the ears of all of us, Father, so that we can hear your word, your voice today. And it can change our lives. And it can move us in the direction of understanding your purpose and destiny for us, Father, and individually and collectively. And, uh, and the way you put us here, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, Coincidentally, that's what we're talking about. Is you know, why did God make you? Why did He put you here? Uh, if you could, if you could ask God one question, knowing that He was going to answer you, and you only had one, you don't get three, you don't get five, you get one. If you could ask Him one question. What would it be? You ever thought about that? Is there a question that you're asking Him? Waiting for him to answer you. Have you thought about that? Do you know what you're here for? Do you know what your purpose is? Uh, why are you here? You know, why you're here can be one thing, and your purpose and destiny can be another. You ever think about that? You want to think about any of that? If you don't, we ought to go home. Uh, you know, years ago there was a secular poem taken. And, and that was it. It was if you could ask God one question, what would it be? And who knows what the number one answer was? Kind of. Why am I here? Why am I here? And, and I think that was taken before uh, Dick, uh, Warren wrote his book about the purpose driven life. And there were enough people that wanted to know what life was about, what purpose of their life was, that that man made an absolute fortune. And fortunately, it didn't change his life and ruin him. Uh, he used it most of it for the kingdom of God, and he's, he's serving God yet today, uh, and blessed in every way that you can be blessed. And, and he wasn't free of trials. He had a, a son that uh, committed suicide. Uh, a couple of years ago, I think it was. He was on TV talking about that the other day. But, uh, but he's a godly man. But everybody wants to know that question. So I want you to imagine with me for just a minute. Uh, by the way, I forgot. Uh, if, if you've been married for 56 years uh, this week, right stand up. 57, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Hallelujah. The rest of you, if I know when your anniversary is, I'll, I'll recognize it. Sometimes I'll, I remember and sometimes I don't. Anyway, I want you to imagine me for a minute. The, the reason it reminded me of that is because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about old people. That, um, <laughs> you, know, you have to be up in age if, you, if you've been married 57 years. But uh, anyway, I want you to imagine with me for a minute that you're... Uh, don't anybody please get offended with this, but, but just imagine that you're you're like up in your 90s, okay? And you just, you know, been through some tests and, and they and they come to you and they say, the doctor comes in in the somber face and he says, he says, listen, you know, I'm sorry, but you know, you need to get your affairs in order because I mean this is hoping that we're all sound mind when we're in our nineties. But uh, but you need to get your house in order because you've only got a short time to live. Put yourself in that chair, in that seat, and what would you think about as you look back over your life? I've known people that, that lived a long life and wasted most of it in various ways and got saved very late in life. That's better than not getting saved, I'll grant you that. But you know, there's just got to be some sadness that comes if you get to the end of your life and can't look back on something that, you know, the old story about when you're gone, it's like taking your hand out of a bucket of water, you know, you 
can't tell it was ever there. And uh, it got to be something sad about looking back over your life and not feeling like you accomplished anything. And, and there's a lot of people, I think, that get to that place. So that's why I want to talk to you today about, about why we're here. And you may kind of get lost in the middle of this a little bit, but uh, I hope not. But uh, it, it has an ending that ends up with that, though it may not be able to all the way through it. But uh, anyway, look at Matthew 22. Uh, I want to start with verse 34, but I'm going to explain first that this verse 34 starts after the Sadducees had already talked to Jesus about the resurrection and he'd already put them in their place and, uh, and shut them up. And in verse 34, it says, But when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together. And one of them, a lawyer, do we have any lawyers in the building? One of them, a lawyer, Ask him a question, testing him, and say, Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? And, and just take note right there that they didn't ask him anything about the prophets. They, he just, they were just interested in the law. They were trying to trap him. Well, what is the great commandment in the law? And uh, they may have been trying to figure out, uh, besides trying to trap him, there's another story where, where Jesus questions in a similar way. And they wanted to know what was the one great thing that I can do to be sure I go to heaven. And that got a different answer. But anyway, he, they wanted to know what was the great commandment. And, uh, and then in verse uh, 37, Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. Now, you know, there's, uh, the, the, they wanted to know about the, the law. And, and the law encompasses a whole lot more than the Ten Commandments, but the Ten Commandments are where the law originated and, and it got expounded on from there. But I want us to look at the question they asked. I mean, Jesus gives them an answer, and we're going to get to that in a minute. But, but let's look. They said, what's the greatest commandment in the law? So let's look at the law. Let's look at the Ten Commandments just to, to kind of put it in perspective. And then we'll come back to Matthew. Uh, you know, in the Ten Commandments, how many of you can recite the Ten Commandments without looking at anything? All of them. Really? Nobody? Man, y'all must be living under grace. <laughs> make sure I wasn't in the boat by myself because I think really have to think to go through them in order. You know? But anyway, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna run through them right quick. They're in Exodus 20, among other places, but uh, Exodus 20 verse 1. Uh, it says and God spoke these words saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, uh, out of the house of bondage. And and number one says you shall have no other gods before me. Period. Number two says, you shall not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that's in heaven above or that is on the earth beneath. So, you know, that's going to help us accomplish number one. Because, you know, if we start making images of things that we like, what do we end up doing? Uh, I, I got a question for you. How many of you have a carved image or a special thing that you really, really like that's really, really precious to you? Hello? Is it parked in your garage or, you know, uh, in, you know never mind. Uh, number, number three, you shall, oh wow, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Hello? And number four is remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. And, and I, I just throw this in for fun. Uh, you know, if, if you if you criticize a preacher, that's early not keeping the Sabbath day. <laughs> Hello? I have a about you. Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> Is that okay? 
Absolutely. Okay, good. Because that's what I say in lieu of... Well, now, if you say it in lieu of a curse word, it's a different story. If you're asking God bless America, my mother told me when I was growing up that you weren't even supposed to say gosh darn or anything like that because those are just, those are just shortening the real thing, you know? And it's just, it's a slang for... Well, let me put it this way. It's between, it's between you and God, okay? I'm not your judge. Thank you. Okay. Uh, okay, back on track now. Uh, but, but the first four are all about God. It's all about, what did he say? He said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your land. So these first four commandments uh, are, are telling us that's what we're supposed to do and how to love Him with all our heart, all our soul, and all our mind. Do we all agree on that? Good. Uh, so what are the last six about? Uh, uh, Matthew 22, 39 says, And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. How many of y'all do that? All the time. I love you, man. Too, bro. He was a Walmart greeter. He, loved, he knows how to love everybody. That's why I hear that job, man. Well, the rest of us need to learn how to do it all the time, right? How many of you don't need to learn how to do it all the time? Okay, I'm just making sure. I'm checking up on y'all. But uh, number five, it says, Honor your father and mother that your days may be long on the earth in the land in which the Lord has given you. When, does it, when do you stop having to honor your mother and father? Never. As long as they're alive, and even after they're dead, you really should honor them, right? Uh, number six, you shall not murder. Now, I'm not going to ask any questions about this one. But uh, you shall not murder. Number seven, you shall not commit adultery. I'm not going to ask anything about that. Uh, number, number eight. You shall not steal. I'm brave. I'll ask about that one. How many of you stole something in your life? Whether, whether you were a kid or what. We all, almost everybody has stole something at one time or other, even if it's a piece of chewing gum or, or whatever. Do you remember what the first thing you stole was? <laughs> Prophetic word. Why, why do you think you remember the first thing you stole? How many of you remember the first thing you stole? Why do you think you remember that? What? You knew it was wrong when you did it. How'd you know it was wrong? Trace of words. God gave you a conscience. Yeah, God yeah. made a way for us to know right from wrong. Amen. Okay. Uh, number nine. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. I bet y'all don't want to talk about that one, right? Huh? Are, are y'all beginning to be glad for the blood of Jesus? Uh, number 10. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, nor his male servant, nor his female servant, nor his ox, nor his donkey, nor any other thing that is your neighbor's. Now, y'all want to talk about that one? How many of y'all have coveted something that somebody else had? Oh, come on. I'm talking back all the way back, you know. Any of us that haven't coveted a whole race in both hands? Some of you just don't want to vote. Well, you know, Matthew, Matthew 22, 40. Uh, on these two commandments, on these two commandments, what did he tell them? He said, he said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and love your neighbor as yourself, right? And on these two commandments hang all. Let's say all. all. How much is all? all? It's every one of them. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Now see, he threw in there the prophets. And don't forget, he's talking to these guys that wanted to know what is the greatest commandment. Well, they didn't mention the prophets. How long did God speak to them through the prophets and talk to them about stuff? So he's reminded them in a general way, you know, hey, it's not just the law. God's been trying to reach you guys through other means also for a long time. And he's still doing that, by the way. But, but if you can imagine two nails 
and holding up a huge, gigantic picture. And it all held up by two nails. Those two things, those two things take care of all ten of the commandments. Because all these last ten are about our relationship with each other. The first four are about our relationship with Him. And He's telling us how to, how to have it, how to maintain it, what to do with it, what not to do with it. It's, and, and the whole Bible is about basically one thing. What is it? It's about relationship. It's all about Jesus. It's all about the cross. But why did He do that? He did that so we could have a relationship with the Father. So God's all about even even the Father. I mean, He's He's three in one. He's He's a family. He's 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 got a relationship between the God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. They interact together. And God wanted some other folks to be in that circle so He could have more relationships, so He could enjoy us more and us enjoy Him more. So God is all about relationship. So you know these people that are that are uh, introverted, like I used to be a long time ago. Long, long, long time ago. What are you laughing at? You don't believe I was ever introverted? I was. That's my wife. Until I was probably 30 years old or more. Yeah, that's enough. <laughs> Sometimes you would be quiet. Uh, but, but it's relationship. And, and God wants us to have a relationship with each other almost as much as He wants us to have a relationship with Him. In fact, He tells us in, in John that we can't have a relationship with each other, really, not a real relationship, not fellowship, unless we have a relationship with Him. So it all works together. Uh, but, but these two truths hold it all together. And, it, and, it, and it, you don't have to worry about the detail of the law. That's what he's saying. He's saying, you know, the whole law hangs on this. And don't forget the prophets. But if we just learn to love the Lord our God with all our heart, all our soul, and all our mind, does, does that leave any part of you out? Everything else comes with those three things, doesn't it? So if we do that, then we have the ability to love each other as we love ourselves. And really, we're supposed to love each other the way Christ loved us. And how did He love us? He died for us. Are you willing to die for me? And no. Are you willing to die for the person sitting next to you? All right, let me ask you another question. I'm going to get real personal. Are you willing to die for the person that you pretty sure is a born again believer, but you don't like them too much? Hello. Are you getting to understand what I'm talking about? We're supposed to. What did you say? But well, he's unlovely. What did Jesus say? He said anybody can love those that are lovable. Love the one that's unlovely, and then you got something to feel good about. Amen. Hello? Okay. Uh, see, a, a loving God created us for His good pleasure. He created us to relate to Him and to relate with each other. But the problem is, is you know, if you don't know me, uh, chances are if I'm having a good time somewhere, you may not like me. Uh, because i got a weird personality, some people tell me, and I joke a lot, and I have fun, and I hurt people. So I, I've worked real hard to get out of that so I don't hurt people, because I don't want to hurt people. But sometimes I hurt people inadvertently, just with my fun loving personality. And I'm joking, and they don't know it, and they get offended, you know. And, and uh, we, we, can, we can learn to get around that if we want to. I shared with somebody yesterday, uh, and, and we made a, a good joke out of it about this person that I used to know that uh, was a pastor's wife, and, and uh, her, she was, had a strong personality, and, and there was a lot of people offended in her circle of friends over a lot of time. But her favorite saying, and, and people would talk to her, you know, and say, well, 
Well, that's the way God made me, and I'm going to be that way till I die, and you might as well get used to it. <laughs> yeah, I thought about using that one time, but I was afraid somebody would slap me. I thought it was easier to change and to learn and to let the love of God flow through me and to learn to, to try to be what He wants me to be and know that He has the power to help me be what He wants me to be if I just love Him with all my heart, all my soul, and all my mind. And seeking with all my heart. You can't if you love him with all your heart, soul, and mind, you're going to be seeking him with all your heart, soul, and mind. And and what does love mean, by the way? I haven't said this in a long time. What? Acting right. Love means acting right. How many of you have thought at some point in your life that love was an emotion? Most people who haven't been taught what the Word says think love is a feeling. And if you ask somebody that's not a Christian that hasn't gone somewhere where they preach it, what's love? And, and when I ask them, that, well, you know, and I feel it's when you feel that somebody's just really committed to you. It's when you feel that, that you care about somebody. It's when you feel that you want to be with. It's when you feel, feel. It is not a feeling. Uh, in in uh, First John, uh, third John, I think it is, is verse six. It says, "And this is love that you walk." How many of you know that this is not a feeling? Okay, when you walk according to the commandments, that's love. It's how you act, no matter how you feel. I, I get. I, no. I, don't know. <laughs> I get, I get frustrated with Russell sometimes. I know, I know, but I can on you better than her. <laughs> I get frustrated with Russell sometimes, you know. And and I can even I can get I can get frustrated with him, but I can still act right towards him. See? He's actually talking to me. No, I would never do that. But but you got you got you gotta understand that part. Uh, but, but let me ask you a question. Are you glad that those guys asked Jesus that question? I am. Because it helps me understand God. And it gave Jesus the opportunity to explain to us as well as them. I wouldn't want to be standing in their shoes and asking for the same reason they did. But since they asked it, and He answered it so precisely and concisely, it helps me to know God's love for me. But, but the point, the overlying point I want to make is that, that through time, uh, God's interacting with, with His people and with us. Uh, everything God's done is to try to show us His love. And from time to time, how many of y'all, from, from time to time, you, you kind of nuzzle up to God a little bit and you get feeling a little close to Him and then you get distracted and you end up feeling like you're off over here and He's off over there. Anybody ever been through ups and downs and peaks and valleys like that? Well, see, the, the Israelites were just like that. Uh, they, they would, they would, he, he loved them. He said, you're my chosen people, and, and you need to do this and this and this and this. And they said, oh, yeah, we'll do that. And then they went off and they didn't do that. So he's a loving God. He wants a relationship, and they're not doing it. And, and, uh, and so he would, he would send somebody to talk to them. And he said, hey, go tell them. You know, they're acting like a harlot, and I want them to come back to me. And they'd go tell them, and they wouldn't do it. And so he said, okay, you go tell them that if they don't come back, I'm going to send an army in there and wipe them out and put them in captivity. And so these people got the feeling that God was a harsh God. Now, he was trying to love them. I mean, when your kid goes out and plays in the street, what do you do? You want to get him out on the street before he gets hurt. Well, God didn't want his people to get hurt. He knew they were better off with him. But he had to take some harsh measures. But he always told them ahead of time. Right? And you tell your kid, don't play in the street, don't you? Or you did when you had a go, you know. But, but through time, I guess you'd have to just say, God got kind of a bad reputation. And they didn't understand him. They didn't have the the New Testament, they, they just have the law and the prophets. But, but we've got to, to, to work at it. We've got to try to understand Him and His character. Uh, but most of what they heard was, was warnings 
are tricks. We sounded like tricks then. They weren't really. They were a loving God uh, trying to call back a wife that had been unfaithful. And he kept sending his friends out saying, hey, go, go tell them I love them. Go tell them I want them to come back. Go tell them I don't want to see them get hurt. Uh, but really, you know, prophets can seem kind of wild eyed and, you know, I mean, like John the Baptist, you know, eating locusts and wearing camel's, camel's coat and, you know, and a belt and, and screaming in the wilderness and even calling out the rulers and telling them what they were doing wrong. And, and then what about, uh, I think it was Isaiah that uh, one, of, one of the prophets ran around naked for three years. And so they kind of get the idea these guys are goofballs or something, you know. And, and so all of this comes into their psyche and, and they're, they're just, they're, they're backing up from God. You know, if you don't understand God and you do something wrong and you get in trouble, what are you going to do? If you think if you have that impression of God, you're gonna you're gonna not want to get too close to him, right? He tells us he's gonna crush us if we don't do that or don't do this or don't go in captivity. So the, the more you misunderstand him and the more he pleads for you to come to him, you're not coming, are you? But when you understand his love, when you understand that he's forgiven all of our sins, when you understand that he did everything so that he could have a relationship with us. When you understand that he doesn't get mad at you anymore, uh, and, and Isaiah, it says, my, under the new covenant, my wrath will no longer come on you. If anything bad comes against you, it's not from me. That's what God said in Isaiah 54. And when we understand that, and we walk in that, and we believe that, then when something bad happens in our life, we can crawl up in his lap. And we say, Daddy, you know, I made mistakes, you know, we had a career. We don't even have to say forgive me, but we can go crawl up in his lap and say, Daddy, I know I brought this on myself and I know I, made, I did this wrong and, and uh, I allowed this or that or the other. Show me how to get out of this. Show me how to fix this. Show me how to get it right. You know? And he usually elbows us and he says, Well, you know, go and talk to whoever it was or go do this. Go make amends for it. Get yourself straight and come on and serve me with all your heart, soul, and mind that love me. And, walk in my ways and we'll walk together and I'll live in you and flow through you and it'll all be good. That's the God we serve, but they didn't understand that. But uh, let's look at a few examples uh, in Hosea. Uh, Hosea 2, verse 13. God's doing the talking. He's, he's talking about, about Israel. He's talking about His chosen people. He says, I will punish her for the days of the bales to which she burned incense. She decked herself with earrings and jewelry and went after her lovers, but me she forgot, says the Lord. That's the kind of messages they got. And they were wrong. They were there to run away from Him. But rather than saying, oh, well, God, you're right, we did that. They just kept on doing it. They kept on rebelling. Uh, Hebrews 2.16, Hosea 2.16. It says, And it shall be in the day, says the Lord, that you will call me my husband and no longer be my master. Call me my, call me my master. What is he saying to them there? He's saying, we're going to get this right sooner or later. You know, you got a choice. When you start acting right, we're going to have a relationship. And then, and then you all think of God as your, your master or your, your husband. You know, you're not supposed to think of him after we get in the right relationship. You're not supposed to think of him as your your master, you know, your ruler. We think of him as our husband. Now, if you got a bad husband, you might have trouble with that. You know? But but God's a good husband. He's the perfect husband. He loves us. He does what's good for us, what's right for us. And he shows us all the stuff he wants us to do and gives us the opportunity to do it. And when we get in trouble and when we have problems in our life, it's because we didn't listen to him, we didn't do it right. Uh, Hosea 2, verse 19. He says, uh, he says, I will betroth you to me forever. I will betroth you to me in righteousness and justice and in loving kindness and mercy. But you see, before he's, he's telling them what will happen if they do it right. He says, I will betroth you, I will betroth you to me in faithfulness 
and you shall know the Lord. It shall come to pass in that day that I will answer, said the Lord. I will answer the heavens, and they will answer the earth. The earth will answer with grain and new wax. So he's telling them, when you do it my way, good things happen. But before that, he had told them a lot of things about going into captivity and all the other stuff. Uh, I didn't do one, one and two. It's just at the point when it first started. He said, when the Lord began to speak by Hosea, the Lord said to Hosea, go take yourself a wife of harlotry, children of harlotry, for the land has committed great harlotry by departing from me, from the Lord. So he went to Gomer, took, took the, the daughter of Diblium, and she conceived and bore a son. Then the Lord said to him, Call his name Jezreel, for in a little while I will avenge the bloodshed of Jezreel on the house of Jehu and bring to an end the kingdom of the house of Israel. He was telling me, You've been running a long time, and I'm going to take care of the whole mess. Uh, but, but then he began to tell them later on what would happen if they just listened. Uh, look at, in Psalms 139, uh, he's, he's, uh, he's talking about how it can come out. First, Psalm 139, verse, uh, verse 1. There it is. He says, O Lord, you have searched me and you know me. You know my sitting down and my rising up. You understand my thought of far off. You comprehend my path, my lying down, my, and, you, and are acquainted with all my ways. You know, when, when you realize that God's acquainted with all your ways, if you don't know Him pretty well, how do you feel? You know everything, God? I mean, everything? God knows everything about you. But he forgets the bad stuff. He overlooks it. It's gone. As far as he's concerned. You know, we, we talk about, you know, God will forget. But, you know, God doesn't forget. He just chooses not to act on it. He chooses not to treat you the way you acted. Because, you know, he, God can to put it away. But to say God can't remember it, uh, he says, I will remember it no more. That means he chooses not to. But he still knows. Hello? But he loves you. And he knows every single thing you've ever done. No matter how bad. And, and sometimes the devil convinces us things are, are real bad that aren't so bad. You know, he has a, a habit of taking a huge magnifying glass and then getting it right up in somebody's face, you know, and, and, and making, it, making what you've done bigger than life and bigger than what anybody else does. Huh? Like making a mountain out of the mold. The devil does that. And God says, it's okay. I know. I know everything. But I love you anyway. When we get to knowing that God loves us anyway, then, then it's going to be good. Uh, Psalm 139 again. Uh, I, I know I'm acquainted with all your ways for there's not a word on my tongue but behold Lord you know it all together you have hedged me behind and before you have laid your hand on me such knowledge is too wonderful for me it's high and I cannot attain it the fact that God knows everything about you all your deepest darkest secrets you think of the thing that you would most hate for anybody in this room to know. And God knows it. He knows it. If you don't know Him in the right way, that'll scare you to death. I think someday you're going to be face to face with Him and He knows it. But you know what? He chose to put it on the cross on the Son. And He chose to let it go away so that He could have a relationship with you and so you wouldn't have to be scared to death. Hello? So what was the original question that we started out talking about? Anybody remember? See, I told you you kind of lose it, maybe. Why am I here? Why are we here? Anybody still want to know the answer to that? Well, if you... Uh, let's go on a little bit. I don't have a watch this morning. But I have cataracts. I can't see that clock's all in trouble. 
What? Oh, okay. Uh, going on, let's get down a little bit to verse 13 in Psalms. And uh, it says, You formed my inward parts. You covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. If you don't believe that you're fearfully and wonderfully made, uh, you should see that little guy that Jan was showing me the other day that went a video that went around a long time ago about the guy with no arms or feet. You know? And he stands up in front of thousands and thousands of people and he says, I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. And he can do anything that, that most of us can't do. Hello? Uh, knowing that you're fearfully and wonderfully made means that no matter what you are, who you are, or what kind of problems you have, God will use you if you're just loving with all your heart, soul, and mind like He said to. Uh, in, in, you, in your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed, and in your book they are all written. The days fashioned for me, when as yet there were none of them. You don't understand how big our God is. How precious also are your thoughts to me, O God. How great is the sum of them. If I should count them... They would be more in number than the sand. Do you think God thinks about you personally and individually that much? You, you know, I, most of us, if we haven't studied and gotten to know Him in a, in a deeper way, I, I think we just don't think He even knows about us. Yeah, He knows in some way, but, but personally enough to care about you, enough to, to come live in you and, and want to guide you along the path of life so that you accomplish something that you can be proud of and bring glory to His name for? Do you think He thinks about you that much? He does. He does. He loves you intimately. Enough that, that He wants to call you His wife. Hello? Are y'all getting anything out of this? And, and don't forget, you know, in 2 Timothy uh, 3.16 it says, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, You know what God reproves us for more than anything in my opinion? For not knowing He wants us to know Him. He wants us to seek Him. He wants us to study His Word. He wants us to get to know His character and His ways so that we can love Him. And everything He does, I think, is geared toward getting us to that place where we do that. But it's, it's profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, and instruction in righteousness. That the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Now, why did God put you here? Hello? Matthew 22, back to where we started, verse 37. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Now, here's the main reason, the main point of the whole thing. That scripture says that that's why He put us here. He put us here so that we could love Him with all our heart, all our soul, and all our mind. What is our soul? Somebody remember? Mind, will, and emotion. Our soul is our mind, will, and emotion. So all of my, my thoughts should be about God. All of my emotions should be about God. And then my will will follow what God wants me to do. Your mind, will, and emotions, if whichever two of those line up, that's what you're going to do. If your emotions and your will are connected, you're a mess. Pure and simple. If your emotions and your thoughts are I said that wrong, I think. If your will and your thoughts are in, in charge of your life, if those two are in agreement and you're hearing God's Word and you're saying, yes, I agree with your Word, God, then your emotions have to come into line. But if your mind and your emotions are connected too much, then your will is out of control and you're doing whatever your emotions tell you. And that's what causes most of our problems. And God wants to fix that, and you fix it by loving Him with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. And then because you do that, and because if you're loving Him with all your, your heart, soul, and mind, and love is what? Love is how you act. And God says, and, and acting is obeying what God said. If you love God, you obey what God said to the best of your ability. 
So if that's the case, then what are you going to do with your neighbor? Because that's the second most important commandment. Love your neighbor as yourself. Act right towards your neighbor no matter how you feel, no matter what he does. What if your neighbor's the biggest jerk in the world? God didn't make any exceptions. He said, love your neighbor as yourself. You tolerate him, you put up with him, you don't go cuss him out, you don't go raise cane with him, you just, you just try to act right towards him. You don't have to try to be in his presence all the time, but when you are, you have to act right towards him. Hello? Now, you know, that's what God put us here for, but how many of you know, even though that's what he put us here for, that we have a, a another purpose and destiny individually. There's all different kind of jobs. Y'all aren't y'all aren't all carpenters, are you? Are any of y'all accountants? Is everybody an accountant? So so God gave us individual purposes, but I maintain that if you don't get these first two right, you're going to have a lot of trouble figuring out what your own personal purpose and destiny is. And God has a destiny for every one of us. And, that's, and that can be the same as your vocation, or it can be different from your vocation. But it's important. How many of you know what your, your destiny is? If you don't know what your destiny is, what, what are you what are you aiming for? You know, I mean, are you just kind of meandering through life? Hello. Oh, wait, huh? Well, if you don't have some idea what God's plan is for you, what your gifts are, and how He might want to use you, you're just going through life. And I maintain that you can't know and be headed towards your purpose and destiny until you first learn to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. And love your neighbor as yourself. You can love the Lord with all your heart, soul, and mind, but if you aren't loving your neighbor as yourself, you can't possibly accomplish his purpose because people are going to be running from you. You're going to be treating them like dirt and hurting them right and left and, and not talking to them and not saying things that are nice and they're going to be running from you. And all the time you're loving God. But you're not loving God because you're not obeying and you're not obeying what he said because he told you to love him as, as yourself. But you know, then you ask the question, maybe, well. You know, uh, if, if loving the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and loving your neighbor as yourself, if that helps you get to your destiny, and if you can't get to your destiny and, and accomplish it right without doing that, what about all these people that aren't even saved and they're all successful and they're getting rich and, and they don't even know God? What about them? Y'all ever thought about that question? Nobody? Or oh, one? Okay, two, three, four, five. Okay. Some people just don't like to raise their hand. I don't ask trick questions anymore, but... <laughs> well, let me, let me just address that and then we'll be true. You know, if, if you get to know God, you've got to know that He's sovereign. And you've got to know that He loves everybody. But He's God, okay? Let me have you know He's God. He wrote the rule book. And he, he can't violate his own rules, but aside from not violating his own rules, he can do whatever he wants to. Right? I didn't say that wrong, did I? Uh, i got to be careful. Anyway, look at Romans 9. Uh, what shall we say to him? Uh, what shall we say to him? Is there unrighteousness with God? Certainly not. There's no unrighteousness in God. Uh, for he says to Moses, he says, I'll have mercy on whomever I will, and I'll have mercy. I'll have compassion on whomever I will. I'll have, uh, I'll have compassion. So then it's not of him who wills, nor of him who runs, but of God who shows mercy. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, y'all remember Pharaoh, don't you? He says, for this very purpose I raised you up, that I may show my power in you, and that my name may be declared in the earth. Now, do you think Pharaoh was saved? Do you think he went to heaven after he got swallowed up in the, in the sea when the waters came back on him? But God used him. And God, God did it. And he had the opportunity. God gave him, how many plagues were there? 
Ten plagues. God gave him ten opportunities to repent and to turn. But who hardened his heart? There's some things that we have a hard time understanding. And you don't have to understand everything. The thing you got to understand is that if you love God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and you love your neighbor as yourself, and you don't worry about the people in the world who aren't loving God and who are lost, and understand God's in control of them too, and let all that go, and you pay attention to you and God, then you're going to be more successful. And you're going to be able to accomplish your purpose and destiny. And you're going to be able to have as good a life as it's possible for you to have. And God didn't make all of us the same to all be rich. And you know, I, I had an opportunity to be rich, really, really wealthy, I believe. But God knew my heart. And God allowed me to be comfortable but he didn't allow me to be filthy rich. Because if he did, he probably knew that I wouldn't be standing here today. And he knows you intimately. And he knows what your purpose and your destiny is. And he knows where you need to end up to accomplish it. And if we learn to listen to him and love him and act right with all our heart, soul, and mind, we'll end up there and we'll be successful, and we don't have to worry about when we stand before Him. We'll stand before Him, and He'll say, Well done, good and faithful servant. And is there anybody in this room that wouldn't like to hear that? There may not be anybody in this room that wouldn't like to hear it, but I dare say there's people in this room that don't think they're going to hear it. And if you don't think you're going to hear it, you need to get to loving God with your whole heart, whole soul, and whole mind real quick. Because you're missing out on some fun in life. And you're missing out on some peace in life. And uh, it, it goes on. Uh, it says, What if God, wanting to show His wrath and make His power known, endured with much long suffering vessels of wrath prepared for destruction? See, God endures those people. Can we endure anybody? Can you endure anybody that's in your life? Anybody that you come in contact with? Do you have the power and the ability to endure? Why don't we? Because we want what we want when we want it. And we're not laying down our lives. So if you're not pleased with me in a strong enough way, then I might, you know. And he might make known the riches of his glory on vessels of mercy. Who is that? He does the one so that he can do the other. So that he might make known the riches of his glory on vessels of mercy uh, which he had prepared beforehand for glory. Even us whom he called, not, not of the Jews only, but also of us Gentiles. And he says also in Hosea, I will call them my people who were not my people. And I'll call her who beloved, who was not beloved. How many of y'all at one time in your life were not beloved? But he called you anyway, and he made you beloved. Okay? You got that? And it shall come to pass in the place where it was said, You are not my people. They shall be called sons of the living God. Did y'all get anything out of that? Well, some of you, if you haven't come into a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, Scripture says that you know, to a lost man that the Word of God is foolishness. It sounds like foolishness. So, you know, if you, if you were thinking today, you know, that's so dude up there, what is he talking about? If you were thinking that, you might ought to ask yourself, do I really know Jesus? Do I really know God? Have I really, am I really in relationship with Him? And, and if you're not, it's so easy. He may be knocking on your heart's door right now saying, hey, did you hear what he said? Hey, I created you. I put you down here to have a relationship with me. And you may know a lot about me, but do you know me personally? And, and a lot of people know about him. They know all about him. But they've never gotten to know him in a personal way. How do you do that? Well, you just surrender. You just say, God, I accept you that you're God. I, I believe, you know, in the Bible, I believe you let your son die for my sin, but I've never acted on it. I've never done anything about it. I just know that you're off out there somewhere. And God, right now, never before, would you come from off out there somewhere and would you come and take charge of my life? 
And would you show me what this book's talking about? Would you show me what this preacher's talking about? Would you help me to understand it person, in a personal way, Father, and be my personal Savior? That's all salvation is, is just meeting me personally and embracing it and saying, I surrender my life to you. You're what it's all about. You created me. You put me here. Let's do it together, God. You do it through me, God. That's all salvation is. And if you've never been there, I sure like to see you get there right now. And it's just as simple. I mean, you can you can do it at home in your closet or under your bed or anywhere. But but it's kind of nice if you do it when he's talking to you right now. If he's talking to you, I'm going to lead you in prayer and give you an opportunity to meet. So that's all about it. And if you're already saved, you pray that, that those that aren't will hear his voice and answer his call. Okay. If that's you, you don't know for sure if you're saved. Even if you think you are and you're not sure, then you need to pray this prayer one more time and nail it down, okay? And then you'll never have to pray this prayer again. Just say, Father, if never before, right this instant, I choose to accept you as my Lord and Savior. I surrender my life to you. I want to know you personally. I want you to know me. And I want you to show me how to live the life that you put me down here for. And I ask you to show me my purpose and destiny. And teach me about you, Father. Help me learn it. In the name of Jesus. Amen. And it says in the Bible, if you prayed that prayer for the first time, that you are like this instant a new creature in Christ Jesus. Something happens, right? When you surrender to Him, something happens and you're transformed into a different kind of person. You came from darkness to light and it changed you. And it says old things pass away and all things will come to you. And if you understand that old things are gone and they're brand spanking new shiny, uh, that ought to get you a little bit excited. Amen. But I won't ask you to dance your number down, down, but it's good for you if you prayed that prayer. That to be willing to raise your hand and say, I prayed that prayer and I'm proud of it and I meant it and I intend to serve Jesus the rest of my life. Is there anybody that wants to remind that there's one? Amen. Anybody else? Anyone? The angels in heaven are dancing because you trusted Jesus right there. Amen. That's what the Bible says. It says when one person, one lost soul comes to the Lord, Angels in heaven dance. You know how many angels there are in heaven? It's a good thing they're dancing on soft clouds because it might get real noisy if they weren't. Amen. I don't know about y'all, but I hope I had fun this morning. You know, I hope that somebody got something out of it. So uh, if you have a, a prayer in need, uh, we'll have some people up here and you can come and we'll pray for you individually. And it's a real nice crowd this morning. I'm sure that y'all were all here. Amen. And uh, the fire, the fire victims on 306. Some of the people at the oh, retreat yes, had okay. said they might, uh, or they had money that they wanted to include yes, for that yes. family. Yes, yes. We took up an offering uh, Wednesday night. Uh, I forget. Wednesday. I think, yeah, Wednesday. For a family whose house burned down and they're, they're really having a lot of issues with it. And uh, so Charlene has a, a basket back there. No cowboy hat. No cowboy hat, just a basket, okay? That's all right. <laughs> but uh, if you want to. to Put something in there to help that family. Uh, I don't think if nobody that goes to church here with people who go to church here know them. And so if you want to help out with that cause, put something in the bucket. And if you have, uh, I guess they need furniture, clothes, and everything. If you've got items that you want to donate, you can sit your arm in and she'll point you to the right place. Amen. So, how many of you glad you came to church today? How do you know when you come to a cowboy church?